have uh, one Old Testament Scripture passage tonight and two New Testament Scripture passages. The Old Testament Scripture passage is Exodus chapter 34, verse 1 through 9. So it can be found in your pew Bible on page 141. 141. Before we read, will you pray with me that the Lord would bless the reading and preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, enlighten us by your spirit. Help us to see that you are set apart. You are holy. Yet you have brought us close. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Exodus chapter 34. This is following Moses' first time in the top of Mount Sinai. We came down to see that uh, the uh, Israelites had made a golden calf. And so the Lord calls them back up to the mountain to make new stone tablets since Moses uh, got angry and threw the other ones and broke them. Here now the reading of God's word. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in the front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up. Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshiped. O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us, although this is a stiff-necked people. Forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Exodus chapter 34. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 through 36, is our first New Testament scripture passage. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 1763. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 through 36, is the closing doxology to Paul's uh, arguments happening from chapters 9 through 11 of the book of Romans, and Paul talks about the mystery of election and God's decree and design to redeem a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And Paul ends with this uh, word of praise. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing now. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And our final New Testament scripture passage is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 17. Can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1834. 1,834. Paul to the church in Colossae. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, 
evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of, his crea- of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's follow the reading of God's holy word. May he bless it to the hands, our hands, hearts, and minds of his people. We're also going to be looking at Lord's Day 47 in the back of your green Psalter hymnals on page 60 in the back. We can say the answer together with one voice. What does the first request mean? Hallowed be thy name means help us to really know you, to bless, worship, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them, your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. And it means help us to direct all our living whatever we think, say, and do, so that your name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. That's the teaching of the Catechism. Rudolf Otto, a 20th century German scholar and theologian, at one time desired, he had a desire to go on the quest to understand what holy means. And he came up with a special term for the holy. He called it the mysterium tremendum. The mysterium tremendum, it's Latin. And a simple translation of that would be The awful mystery. This is how he described holy. The feeling of it may at times come sweeping like a gentle tide, pervading the mind with a tranquil mood of deepest worship. It may pass over into a more set and lasting attitude of the soul, continuing, as it were, thrillingly vibrant and resonant until at last it dies away and the soul resumes its profane, non-religious mood of everyday experience. It may burst in a sudden eruption from the depths of the soul with spasms and convulsions or lead to the strangest excitements, to intoxicated frenzy, to transport and to ecstasy. It has its wild and demonic forms and can sink to an almost grisly horror and shuddering. It has its crude, barbaric antecedents and early manifestations. And again, it may be developed into something beautiful and pure and glorious. It may become the hush, trembling, and speechless humility of the creature in the presence of whom or what? In the presence of that which is a mystery, inexpressible, and above all, creatures. That is the holy, according to Rudolf Otto. Holiness can be something that eludes us. It's something that we often say in Christian circles and communities, but maybe don't truly understand. And maybe we have 
a definition for it, but we've never experienced it. The feeling that something that is happening to us is holy, or that the God we are praying to is holy. So my prayer tonight is that we would come to a, a deeper understanding of what it means to hallow the name of God, to holy the name of God. And maybe we would come away not feeling so much like Rudolph does, that it's an awful mystery, but more so grounding and rooting ourselves in what the holiness of God means to us and for us in our lives. So, particularly in our prayer lives. Our theme tonight is, in Christ, we pray for God's name to be made holy in our lives. In Christ, we pray for God's name to be made holy in our lives. We have three points tonight. The first is right knowledge. The second is right praise. And the third is Right life. Right knowledge, right praise, right life. Let's look at this first point here. Right knowledge. When we talk about this first request, request in the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> hallowed be thy name, um, we're talking about what the word holy means. It means to set apart. So, it finds its meaning in other terms that we use in the Bible and in our Christian lives. Sanctified. So when we say, hallowed be your name, what we're saying is... Uh, let your name be sanctified among us. Let your name be set apart among us. And the first thing that the catechism says is, help us to really know you. Help us to really know you. So that's why we're talking about this first point, right knowledge. Help us to really know you. What does it mean to really know the Lord in Exodus chapter 34, we see this interaction between God and Moses. And what, what is happening here is, is a self-revelation of God, a self-disclosure of God. God is revealing himself to Moses in a deeper and more profound way. Already he came to Moses and he proclaimed to Moses his name. I am that I am, Yahweh. Tell the people, I am sent them, sent you to them. But here upon the mountain, Mount Sinai, when God is uh, giving Moses instructions about the new stone tablets, we're told the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. He is declaring his name over Moses. Declaring his name to Moses once again. But unlike the first time, this time a little bit more description is given, a little bit more context, a little bit more content is given. He's not just saying, I am that I am, I am the self existent one. He's also saying, proclaiming to Moses as he passes in front of him Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. 
this uh, statement right here in Exodus chapter 34 would be something akin to what we call a confession or a catechism answer that's used throughout all the Old Testament. It's pivotal points in the Old Testament or all the way throughout the Psalms. This quotation, the self-declaration of God, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassion and grace is God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, so on and so forth, it becomes an echoing statement, a confession of faith for the Hebrew people about who God is. We need right knowledge of God. And if that right knowledge of God is self-declaration of God, God declaring to Moses, this is who I am. I am, I am that I am, I am that I am, slow to anger, compassionate, gracious, abounding in love and faithfulness. Then there's only one place where we can access, where we can be sure that what we are receiving is right knowledge about God, and true knowledge about God. And that is in God's self-revelation, His Word. Right knowledge of God, to say the least, comes from God. One of the uh, statements of uh, the time of the Reformation was ad fontis. That means back to the sources. And the concept was that you went not back to the translation of the translation of the translation, but you went back to the original sources. You went and you read the Greek, you know, you read the Hebrew. When it comes to right knowledge, a true knowledge about God, we as a people of God should know that that knowledge can be found and is only found where God has given it to us. In the self-revelation, in the Word of God, self. And it's when we go to the Word of God that we find there a magnificent and wholesome and full description for us insofar as we need to know of who God is. And if there is one thing that we can determine when we look at the Word of God... That the God we see described in the Bible is unlike any other creature or any other thing or any other person that we have ever come into contact with. He is completely and totally other. He is holy. He's holy. We need right knowledge of God if we are going to, in Christ, pray for God's name to be made holy in our lives. We need to know what we are praying for, that we are praying in accordance with what God has revealed about himself. If we pray for God to be holy in our lives, to be made holy in our lives, but we think of God as so much smaller or insignificant than he really is, than he's revealed himself to be. If we make God something that we can fit inside our minds, we can fold up and put in our pockets, that God is really just like us, then God will never be holy in our lives. We need right knowledge of God. But if all we had was a knowledge of the complete otherness of God, how he is completely other, holy, holy, holy. If all we had of God was Isaiah's vision of God in the temple, holy, 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 then we would be much like what Martin Luther's experience was. Martin Luther understood that God was a holy God and that he was not, and it tormented him. He spent most of his waking hours in penance, confessing to brothers in the monastery because he knew that God was holy, set apart, and that Luther himself was a wicked man full of sin. In fact, 
There's many historians who believe that the health problems that Martin Luther had later on in his life were due to the torment he underwent when he was made conscious of and aware of the holiness of God and his very own sin. But what about this second point, right? Praise. Catechism continues. Not only does it say, help us to really know you, help us to have right knowledge of you. If we're going to holy the name of God in our prayers, if we're going to ask in Christ that his name would be made holy in our lives, help us to really know you so that we can bless these verbs, worship, praise, so that we can bless, worship, and praise you for all your works and for all that shines forth from them. And this description is given, your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. And Paul knew the holiness of God. Paul understood it. He spent the first part of his life as a Pharisee, and keeping the letter of the law as best he could. He knew that God was set apart. Paul studied the law. Right now I'm uh, reading through uh, the Old Testament and I'm in the book of Leviticus. And much of the book of Leviticus is uh, set this apart, sprinkle oil on this, set this apart. And all the elements of the tabernacle are being set apart for use in God's holy temple. I just read the story of Nadab and Abihu. All this instruction was given about how God should be properly worshipped. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, authorized, gave, uh, offered unauthorized fire to God and God consumed them. So, so much detail is given in the Old Testament about how God is holy. But uh, how should we praise God? Well, we're called to praise Him for His almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. You see, it's in the coming of Christ that we see the whole picture of God's revelation. We see the whole picture that God is not holy in isolation from all His other attributes. God is completely holy and God is completely merciful. God is completely wrathful and God is completely graceful. God is not a God of parts made up of a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but God is simple. He is one being, perfect in all of his attributes. And it's in the cross that we see that the holiness of God is not opposed to the grace and mercy of God. That in Christ, God can be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith. And so, in the book of Romans, when Paul goes into this great exposition of the grace and mercy of God, this great exposition about how God has been working throughout all of redemptive history to this very moment and in the coming of Christ and in the coming of the gospel and in the coming of the good news and the coming of, of the people of Israel giving way to, to the Gentiles and how both of these components will be brought together in perfect harmony at the end of time. He bursts out in praise, in praise that is correlating with, in praise that is in sync with the way God has revealed himself in his word. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. 
Amen. Our reason for having right knowledge is not so that we would just have these big heads full of uh, all this understanding about how, who God is so we can have fun theological debates on Facebook groups or we can argue with each other about Josh was like, oh, maybe a little bit that. <laughs> so we can argue with each other about what this scripture means or this scripture means. The reason why God has revealed himself in his word is so that we could praise him rightly. To know him is to praise him. To know him in Christ is to exude forth, overflowing with blessing and worship and praise for all God's works, for all that shines forth from them, His almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. Well, the question has to keep going. Not just right knowledge of God that verse forth and praise and worship. But there's a problem, I think, in our day and age. It's a problem that has been around for a long time. And that is when we talk about blessing and worship and praise we're often only thinking about church service. We're only thinking about Lord's Day worship. But in the Lord's Prayer, when we pray, hallowed be thy name, when we pray, God, may your name be set apart among us, God, may your name be made holy in our lives. We're not just talking about in our Sunday morning worship services, and our Sunday evening worship services. We're not just talking about when we're gathered together and hearing the preaching of the word and lifting up our voices in song. We're talking about a prayer that encapsulates all of us. And so, the catechism continues. Not only does it say that when we pray, hallowed be thy name, are we asking for God to help us really know him so that we may rightly worship him. But there's a second thing. It means help us to direct all our living what we think, say, and do. So, when I say all of us, I'm thinking holistically. Think, say, and do. The inside and the outside. Help us to direct all our living, what we think, Say and do so that your name will never be blasphemed because of us, but always honored and praised. Colossians chapter 3, much like what we read this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, talks about this. And I mentioned it to you this morning when I talked about the indicative and the imperative. This passage exemplifies this characteristic as well. Paul, starting in chapter 3, says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
The reality is you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That is the spiritual reality. That is set in stone. Yet nonetheless, we walk around here on a broken and fallen world still struggling with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so Paul says, become who you are. Strive after what has been accomplished. Put to death as you live whatever belongs to that earthly nature. That nature, that part of you that does not hallow the name of God, the Father, does not sanctify it, set it apart, and make it holy. And Paul mentions here things that correlate with what the Catechism tells us, what we think, say, and do. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. <clears throat> idolatry. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie. Should you've taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly love, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Over all these virtues put on love. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Give you thanks to God the Father through him. When we have right knowledge of God that comes from his word, our life should explode into right praise of God, blessing, worshiping, praising him for all his works, but not simply in the church service. Not simply outwardly in the, the, the things that we do, but in all of our life. A right life. Think, say, and do. When we know what is true about us because of what God has done in Christ. Remember, we're praying in Christ. We pray for God's name to be made holy in our lives. When we know that we are in Christ. We're praying that God would bring these imperatives to bear upon us by his spirit and work them in us by his grace. We pray that we would come to understand more and more that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and that our life here on earth is meant to progressively reflect that reality. Not perfectly. It's not about perfection. It's about progression. In thought, word, and deed. When we pray in Christ that God's name would be made holy in our lives, we're saying, God, make your name be holy in my thoughts. God, make your name be holy in what I say. God, make your name be holy in what I do. in our hearts, in our minds, in our hands. We ask this so that we who bear the name of God, since we are made in the image of God, would not be a reason why others would think lightly of who God is but they would desire to honor and praise him. But as representatives of Yahweh, who is compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in steadfast love and kindness, will be made known through us by what we think and we say and we do. We would express that God is a holy God 
Let us reach down in Jesus Christ, his son, to redeem us from our sins and to draw us to his heart. Remember Rudolph, he thought that uh, the holiness of God was an awful mystery. And it can be something that we assume and it can be something that we often may not grasp entirely. But it is a reality that we are called on by Christ to pray would grasp our hearts and our lives. Leah McCoy in her short book on the Lord's Prayer says it like this. When you pray, draw near to the throne of grace with the innocent trust of a child. Look around that throne and realize his home shall one day be your home too. Then focus your eyes on his face and hallow his name. When you hallow his name, you might just slip out of your father's lap and onto the floor at his feet. You might bow low in reverence and awe and wonder that the God of the universe would choose to be the lover of your soul. May the name of the Father be holy in our lives. Because in Christ we pray that God's name would be holy and all that we think, say, and do. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. That your holiness was revealed to us in Christ Jesus, your Son, and that your grace was revealed to us in Christ Jesus, your Son. And we pray, Lord, that you would Continue to reveal yourself to us in your word that we may really know you and that we, we may really worship you for all your works and for who you are that shines forth through them. And we pray as well, Lord, that our lives would shine forth that you are a holy God to be honored and praised. We pray, the Lord, that you would sanctify our minds and our hearts and our hands. That in what we think, you would be set apart. And what we say, you would be made holy. And what we do, you would be hallowed. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Celebration Annual 33. Immortal, immortal, invisible, God only wise. Immortal, invisible, God only wise.